What's up, you guys? Sean Ross at Managing Editor at Fightful.com, FightfulMMA.com. Go over there, get all of your MMA news, your results, your columns, all that good stuff. But right now, it's the Fightful MMA podcast for September 10th. We are joined by one showdown Joe Ferraro. You can find him on Twitter at Joe A. Ferraro. Joe, this was a busy week of MMA, Bellator 226. We had UFC 242. The BMF belt talk, I can't wait to get into that, but man, this lots of stuff happening. Conor McGregor wants to fight Habib in Russia, all this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know you were throwing it my way. Yeah. Uh, what's up, everybody? Yeah, no, I totally agree because um, I'm, I'm down with this BMF belt. Like, yeah, I, I really me too. Like this BMF belt. I, I think, you know, Dana's saying it's going to be one and done. I don't know, man. Hell no. It's it. Whoever wins, it's going to be calling everybody out. They're going to call their own title shot. I think they should keep it. I mean, The Rock wants to put the belt around, uh, did he say Masvidal or Diaz's waist? Whoever's, I yeah, believe. Yeah, right? Like, come on, man. You got yourself something that's kind of different uh, in combat sports. You got to run with it. But uh, yeah, Bellator 226 and that little bit of a disaster. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, what happened with Habib and Poirier and, 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 and the whole event in Abu Dhabi. So yeah, good show. Good show coming up. So let's go ahead and talk about this BMF belt thing. And you know, The Rock said that he wanted to strap whoever whoever became champion. Now, this is right up Pro Wrestling's alley. I don't know if you remember the Stone Cold Smoking Skull belt that he had back in the day. Oh, uh, I didn't know. Yeah, when he won the championship, he had it customized where it had like a smoking skull. There was one actually made for The Rock with a big Brahma Bull on it that didn't end up getting used. But, so, and, and I got to tell you, Two months turnaround on a belt, they're having that rush made if 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 they are because that's it's not easy to have a belt made in that amount of time, have it altered and all that stuff, and put out there. But Nate Diaz, Georgia Jorge Masvidal, uh, UFC in Madison Square Garden. This comes after Colby Covington was given a take it or leave it offer by the UFC. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that momentarily, but. We've said this before, Nick or Nate Diaz and Masvidal doesn't need a title, but hey, if you're going to put one on the line, I'm okay with this, Joe. I love it. I think it's, it's I, I tell you, I, th- I think it's absolutely fantastic. You got yourself a situation where it's a belt that has nothing to do with the actual championship belts in the UFC, and you got yourself a situation where people are going to tune in. I mean, just the very fact, if The Rock is speaking about it, then you know there's a whole bunch of other celebrities that are like, oh. What's going on here? Every one of his, not every one of his followers, but a la, uh, a vast majority of his followers are probably like, oh, what is this? Or what's going on? And then the UFC followers of The Rock are going to be like, hell yeah, let's get this done. All right? Like, I think it's a fantastic idea and it's easy to run with. You can run with it as long as, man, they've been running with the ultimate fighter for what, 25 seasons? Exactly. Come on, man. You got yourself something hot right now. Run with it. Do it. I love it. Uh, I love the idea of Diaz and Masvidal headlining the show. I love the idea of the BMF belt. I don't think it should be one and done. I think it should be very selective in who it's defended against, though. Like, I mean, I think people will understand when that's arbitrarily defended. It's not a real championship. However, this fight was booked because Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington was not booked. Now, last week on Do You Believe Dana White, our recurring segment here, you said... No, I don't believe that this fight is booked. I don't believe that it's ready. And it wasn't, Joe. Colby Covington comes out and says that they made him a take-it-or-leave-it offer. Now he and his uh, training partner, so to speak, Masvidal, are beefing a little bit. Masvidal not happy that Covington is is bringing up his name. What do you make of this? That UFC, for some reason, can't or won't book Usman versus Colby. I don't know what the whole Colby situation is like in terms of what exactly the deal is in terms of the offer the UFC is offering or offering him. I'm I'm assuming they are offering what's in his contract, Mm -hmm. right? And then from there, Colby's like, well, main event, title fight, pay-per-view, MSG, MSG. Maybe he wants more. Maybe he wants more points. Maybe it's on on his side or his camp saying got, we got, can get more. Got the Trump family paying attention to UFC showing up to his fights. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, we don't really know exactly what the offer is. So for example, let's say he's in his contract. If he gets a title fight uh, and he and, and his pays, let, let's just throw some arbitrary numbers. Sean, three hundred thousand uh, flat, or five hundred thousand yeah. flat, and you know one point or two points on the pay per view. 
right? Let's say that's in his contract, and that's what the UFC is offering him. If he comes back and says, no, I want a million and three points, UFC is going to be like, whoa, dude, really? No, we can't do that. So we don't know what's going on there. Or do the UFC renege on their offer and basically say, no, no, you know what? You're going to get 100000 flat, and we'll give you one point on the pay-per-view. Like, we, we don't know. We don't know what the actual deal is. But it'd be interesting to see, you know, because Colby's saying that that he's tired of how the UFC is treating him and the offer isn't there. But I'd love to hear from Kamaru uh, what Kamaru thinks. I'm sure Kamaru's perfectly fine in just, you know, fighting the guy because he's been dying to fight him for a long time. But this is part of prize fighting. This is the industry. This is all about, you know, you, you want to maximize every time you fight, you want to maximize the, the revenue. I, I completely get that. And Covington... He keeps winning, and you can say what you want about about his methods, but he keeps winning, and he gets attention. Although it doesn't always translate to views or follows or or viewership, apparently. But uh, UFC is hoping that UFC 242 did that. Habib Nurmagomedov, Molly Watt, Dustin Poirier. There was a brief flurry in round two where Dustin Poirier showed some glimpses, and hey, he did something that Conor McGregor couldn't do. He went at Habib Nurmagomedov, clipped him with a couple of punches, but Habib would wade his head around. You couldn't tell if he was messed up. You couldn't tell if he was off balance. You couldn't tell if he was just uh, trying to utilize head movement, and that that's a pretty good tactic. Nurmagomedov chokes out Dustin Poirier. What did you think of Habib's performance? Well, a typical performance. I, I was laughing when I was watching the fight where they have that one camera angle where they're go- looking through the cage. Every Habib fight is like that, right? Yeah. So that, that one significant... Uh, camera angle that's always there for Habib fight because he takes his opponents, puts them against the cage, takes them down, and then just proceeds to maul and brawl them until they quit or he catches a tap out or, or something of that nature. Very typical of, of a Habib fight. Um, I thought Dustin would be able to do a bit more. Even he said he goes, just wasn't able to get off. I mean, I think it was in the first round or second round where he says, I just can't get any space or I can't get this guy off me or whatever it is. Just that was, that was demoralizing show. to hear that Yeah, in between. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, it's, and plus the heat. Like people can say, I don't know who was was saying that. You know, who Joanne. cares? Yeah, the heat's the heat. It's hot, man. Like, I mean, I, I've been there. Uh, I mean, Felder called it correctly in his post-fight interview, saying it's cooler in there uh, fighting than it is for the you know the, the broadcasting crew in their suits. Because I've yeah. been in venues. Uh, you know, Nagoya in Japan is one where you just you're soaked. I can just imagine trying to fight in that temperature under those hot lights. So no AC. They didn't easy. even finish building the thing. Yeah, that that's another thing, right? So uh, I, I feel terrible for Dustin Poirier because you know this is what he dreamed about uh, his whole career. He had the opportunity, and it, it's you know oftentimes you only it only happens once in your career, right? Once in your career, and you got to do your very best to some way somehow uh, emerge victorious. But Habib's Habib, man, the guy is something special. Uh, he's a fantastic fighter. Uh, he's not perfect. He is beatable, yeah. and I, I think the blueprint is out there as to how you beat this guy. But can you do it? You know, it's it's going to take a time. It's going to take a while. And Poirier was emotional after the fight. He'll always have that championship to, ha- to put up on his mantle, um, that that interim title, and that's a lot further than a lot of guys go. He's still very young. He's like thirty years old. He's he's a guy that reinvented himself at one fifty five after being a top prospect at one forty five and not quite making it. Next for Habib appears to be Tony Ferguson, if they can get the fight made, said Dana White. And I like that Dana White was like, okay, listen, I appreciate Connor saying we'll fight in Moscow, but you can't deny Tony Ferguson anymore. Uh, Over the past year, Joe, we have had four people who laid legit claim to being a 155-pound champion. You had Habib Nurmagomedov, who had won the title. You had Tony Ferguson, interim champion, who never lost. It. Dustin Poirier, who became interim champion. And Conor McGregor, who had never lost his 155-pound championship. McGregor and Poirier are off that list. It's Habib. It's Tony now. Here's the thing. 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. They tried to make this fight. It didn't happen. But... Even though I see this as like a 300,000 buy show under the old method, I don't know what the hell they do now, and we probably won't ever know until UFC goes public, but it's a fight that has to happen for the sport, Joe. I think it has to happen. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's the fight that I'm definitely looking forward to the most. Um, it's We've seen what F- Ferguson does and the pressure he puts on fighters from the opening bell uh, until he breaks somebody. Habib is the same way. He just 
closes the distance, takes them down, and puts them down until he breaks them, catches a submission, uh, or, or gets the TKO. Uh, depending on the talent, people might say, oh, look at what he did with some of this fighter or that fighter. Listen, when Habib's fighting the top of the top, he, he fights a different game than when he's fighting someone that's lower in the rankings. He seems to... It reminds me of my soccer team sometimes where they, you know, they play to the level of their opposition. Uh, the higher, the better. The lower, it just it kind of goes on yeah. cruise control. This is the fight that we need for the division. This is the fight that I think poses a fair amount of danger to Habib Nurmagomedov. And, of course, a fair amount of danger to Tony Ferguson, who's on his little run. Uh, that's quite significant as well. So uh, it's the fight that, that, that's going to answer a lot of questions in this division. Uh, and, of course, if it's uh, Ferguson that emerges victorious, there's a rematch there for Habib. It'll be his very first loss in his career. And if Habib emerges victorious, then what do you do, right? So there's lots of beautiful questions and answers that, you know, we need to have addressed here. But it is the fight to make, despite the MMA gods stepping in all the time and not giving us this fight. You got to try and put it on and get it done as soon as possible. Conor McGregor indicated that he wanted to fight Habib in Russia. I don't have a desire to see that. I don't. I, I would like to see Conor McGregor fight Donald Cerrone or Justin Gaethje or somebody like that, and I, I just don't have a desire. I know what's going to happen. Zero, zero. There's no desire. Like when, when I saw that post or that, I want you know, I'll do the rematch in Moscow. Come on, man. Like I, I, I get the the massive following that the guy has and that he's done so much for the sport, but at some point we have to make the calculation of of who's relevant right now. And I get Connor is a huge name uh, and relevancy or not because he's a, he's a you know a champ champ and stuff like that. But times have changed. Things have happened since he last competed, and things have happened over his past two or three fights in the UFC, notwithstanding the the, the money fight, right? Like so many things have happened in this division that it gets to a point where that's potentially the money fight for Habib. That's potentially the money fight for the UFC. That's potentially a huge gate uh, in Russia. I get that that makes sense. But I don't have any desire like yourself to watch it at all. I don't. I, I could care less uh, of a Conor McGregor taking on Habib Nurmagomedov. I want to see the Ferguson fight ahead uh, of the Conor McGregor fight. I want to see Conor McGregor fight somebody in the top five, uh, get a win, and then potentially get a title shot. A dominant win versus somebody in the top five, Sean, give him a title shot. Because, you know, technically he would deserve it despite being away for so long. He came back after a long period of time, hypothetically speaking, and emerged victorious. Get her done. Elsewhere on the show, number 10, Paul Felder, controversial win over Edson Barboza. How'd you score this one, Joe? Close. It was close. I mean, I kind of gave the edge to Felder, uh, two rounds to one. Uh, I don't know where someone gave Barboza 30-27. I, I find that weird. I think the, the key point in this fight here was in the second round, uh, which is kind of weird when I listen to Dominic Cruz because I'm, I'm arguably one of his biggest fans, not just as a fighter, uh, but as a commentator as well. But we take a look at that second round. Edson Barbosa shoots in for the takedown. He gets the takedown. But it was Paul Felder that did the damage off of his back. Right? Yeah. Uh, th there was one fight. And I don't know if it was the Barbosa-Felder fight or if there was another fight, maybe the Calder or someone's fight where the person took down the other person in the last 10 seconds and Dominic was like, there you go. There you go. That's how you win the round. No, it's not how you win the round, actually. Uh, according to the unified rules in judging, a takedown does not win you around. A takedown takes the fight where you want it to go, but now you have to proceed uh, and do damage. If you're sitting there and watching, uh, uh, let, let's for argument's sake, talk about a street fight, and, and two guys or two girls are fighting each other, and the one person takes down the other fighter, uh, and that's the basically the only thing they did in that fight, Yeah, they didn't, they didn't win the fight. They just took the person down. There's no fight there. You have to fight. So if your takedown is what you want to do to continue fighting, because you now want to fight on the ground, you have to continue fighting. A takedown just means you've taken the fight in a different direction. You didn't win the fight. You didn't win the round. I don't believe that should be the difference in winning a round. It's weird as it sounds, but sometimes that's how judges, that's what fighters do. I mean, if you go back to the WEC days of Dominic Cruz, and even when he got to the UFC, he was the master at it. He was the master of going for a takedown in the final minute of a round, final 30 seconds, final 10 seconds, uh, to try and convince the judges that he won the round. Well, technically, well, he was dominating the rounds anyways. But in a in, in a close fight, I don't believe that should be the difference. You're not trying to end the fight. You're changing the, where the fight is being located at. 
13 of 16 media members had it for Barboza. 71% of fans had it for Barboza. Even more damning, 1.7% of the fans had it for Felder beating Barboza via 30-27. It's one of the scorecards read. What that means to me, Joe, objectively, that judge was wrong. That judge was wrong. If you can't get... Oh, by the way, no media members scored at 30-27, Felder. Not a one. Yeah. Not That's a crazy. one. So yeah. <laughs> It wasn't 30-27. That's insane. So it was less than 1% of respondents agreed with that person on the scorecard. Um, also, no media members scored at 30-27, Barboza. You had... 3.4% of fans scoring at 3027 Barboza. So you had two scorecards on uh, of this that jived with about approximately I don't know 2.5% overall maybe. Oh my god. Maybe yeah, maybe 3 or 4 if you include media. It's rough. That's rough. That's bad, Joe. Bottom line is what is the fighter or which fighter is doing what to end the fight? Which fighter's doing what to cause damage? That, that's what you've got to look at. In the first round, Barbosa won that round. In the second round, despite getting the takedown, Felder won that round. And in the third round, that's kind of the swing round, in my opinion. You can take a look at who did more damage. If you didn't, if you didn't watch rounds one and two, and you only watched round three, that's how your mentality has to be when it comes to unified rules of MMA. What are you watching? Who's doing what to try and finish the fight? And you can make the argument for both guys. I personally gave it more to Felder. I gave it to Felder, and that's why I scored it at 29-28 Felder. Elsewhere on this show, uh, we had Islam Makachev defeating Davi Ramos. Ramos claiming that he was a good matchup for Habib. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> Diego Ferreira defeating Meyerbeck Tysimov. Big win for him. You had Tukagov def- uh, fighting Leron Murphy to a split draw. If you're Murphy, you got to be thrilled with that, even though Tukagov has taken a long time off. Sarah Morass uh, picked up a big win, but she missed weight. Bilal, well, I will get to Bilal Muhammad. Uh, Muslim Sakhalov uh, just starched Nordin Taleb. You have Ar- Omari Akhmedov defeating Zach Cummings, Don Madge over Ferris Ziam. But there are some fights that I thought really stood out on this show, Joe. Curtis Blades is real good. He is real good, and he has nothing resembling a submission game. He, it's like he doesn't want to. And he just pounds people out and drags people down. And whatever it is about Nganu, that's his kryptonite. But this guy is so good. I want to see him fight a top five guy. Because Shamil was a number nine guy and deserving of that that spot. But Curtis Blades is just so good. Yeah, and we talked about it during the last show, leading up to that event there. You know, Did Curtis Blades do what he had to do uh, in, in the last fight or so? Uh, was he really trying to do trying to finish guys as opposed to just beating them down. Well, this time he not only beat his guy down, he finished him. And that's what he needed uh, to continue doing what he's doing in this division. Currently, uh, according to the rankings, which were updated, what, yesterday, he's number three, uh, but he's not getting in Ganu. Uh, all depends on what Cormier wants to do next. Does Cormier get the, re- the, the trilogy bill with Miocic, right? And, he, you know, Curtis is not getting that title shot versus Stipe. Uh, Junior's now booked with uh, Alexander Volkov. Uh, Derek Lewis doesn't deserve a rematch with Curtis Blades. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the whole Alistair Overeem, Cain Velasquez options as well. Right. But again, now we're dropping down to number eight. So Curtis Blades is a fantastic fighter. I, I, I keep, I was looking at his physique in this fight here and I thought to myself, he's a big guy, but he's lean. He's a lean heavyweight when you really take a look at his body type. If you get the side profile this guy, he's lean, which means he's muscular and he's got tons of power. So kudos to this guy. This guy's a fantastic fighter, always has been. Uh, I, I, I hate the fact that Ngannou's his kryptonite because it would have been so sweet if you beat him the, le- the second time and we could potentially get a trilogy yeah. belt right now, right? But we're not going to get it because Francis does have two victories over him. Joanne Calderwood, big win over Andrea Lee. Andrea Lee had looked great in her UFC run thus far, but Joanne Calderwood is finally realizing that potential a little bit more consistently since she's not having to cut that weight. Um, another name that I think that we have to look at is Otman Azatar. Jesus Christ, that guy. This He fought Timu Pakalan, and this was a mismatch from the jump, but all things considered, I think it was a fair first opponent for him. Wow, that was a performance, Joe. Uh, it was scary. 
uh, it was just like what in God's name was in that punch just in general. But yeah, we've got to start paying attention to this guy. What sucks, let's be honest, Sean, he's a lightweight. Yeah. Like, <laughs> dude, you, as much as that performance was just, you know, eye opening, you got some work to do, son. You got some Lots work to it. do. Like that division is just uh, a murderer's row of killers, not one to 10, like one to 25. It's insane. So lots of work for him. But yeah, we're looking forward to seeing him compete uh, on the regular. Bilal Muhammad, we talked about how he would just be kept on the early fight pass prelims if he didn't get like an impressive win. Thought he did. I thought this was a good fight. And then he choked out Takashi Saito, the kind of performance that he needed to advance his career. Because let's be honest, a decision win, no matter how dominant, I don't think it would have really advanced his career, Joe. No, I wouldn't have. I mean, but the fact that he's on the early prelims is one thing. Uh, the fact that he got a finish is the second thing. Uh, I think what, for his sake, uh, getting a finish in the first or second round is much better than getting a finish in the third round, despite getting the finish. Like, let's yeah. give the guy kudos, right? He broke he broke down Sato and was able to get that um, that rear naked choke. But for Bilal's sake, it's tough, man. At 170, it's not easy. you got to try and get those finishes in the first or second round. Extremely difficult to do, but that's what really puts you on the radar uh, for the UFC, because if they're matchmaking, for the most part, when they're matchmaking, they're basically saying, for the most part, you are equal to this person here as you move up the ladder. Let's see what you can do. If you're going to decisions, then you're staying at that portion of the rankings, uh, their internal rankings. If you start finishing guys, they move you up to that next level. And there's so many different levels uh, in each weight class, specifically lightweight, featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight, that you know, you've got to get through this little bubble of guys to the next one and then see where you go from there it's when you start seeing like that like the run that um vulcan uzdemir had you know like start off at this level take him out move up to the next one take him out oh my god what do we got boom title shot right do you start finishing people in the first round a guy that the ufc has in that little segment of the what nate diaz and calls the bracket that little portion there you move up you start getting bigger fights you get onto the prelim cards on the television portion uh, as well as main cards Bellator 226, it was. Uh, Pedro Carvalho defeated Sam Cecilia with a neck or a face crank in round two of the Ouch. opening round. Emmanuel Sanchez beat ya boy Taiwan Claxton submission with a triangle choke. Adam Borks defeated Pat Curran TKO via strikes with one second left in that round. You see a real changing of the guard here, especially with this fight. And Derek Campos defeated Daniel Strauss. You got some 30 25s there. That was disheartening to see. Uh, yeah. Daniel Strauss is one of my first MMA interviews ever. A Cincinnati guy. Bummed me out to kind of see that. But you have Sanchez, Borix, Campos, and Carvalho moving along in this tournament. Uh, I'll say this. A lot less sexy than if you had former champions moving along and a hot prospect moving along. But these were all very definitive victories, Joe, in their own rights. So there there wasn't like a lot of controversy or anything in that regard. The right people moved on because the right people won. Yeah, I mean, I feel terrible for Daniel Strauss, right? That's that's three of four, right? Um, he just got dominated. It, it's it's tough to watch. He's 35 years old, uh, obviously a blue-collar fighter, fantastic wrestling in general, but Campos is Campos, right? It, it's just, you know, what do you do with Daniel Strauss right now? Uh, Carvalho and Cecilia, ouch. That was not fun to watch kind of thing. You know, like, I, you, you've been in neck cranks, man. You do catch wrestling. They, yeah. they are not, when you get somebody that knows how to put it on, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't look painful, but damn it, it is painful, right? Um, and, and Curran going down the way he did, or, or yeah, it's, it's, it's MMA mileage, right? It's MMA mileage. We talked about that during the last show. It's just MMA mileage. And, you know, good for Emmanuel Sanchez, right? He emerges victorious second round. Again, uh, slick submission. Once you squeeze those knees, triangle choke nappy time, right? Good for him. Yep. Uh, I, I I thought that the tournament went as well as it could from a quality perspective. Then the main event happened. Oh, boy, the main event happened. Ryan Bader fought Chet Congo to a no contest because there was an eye poke. I mean, there's always a foul on a Chet Congo fight. It just went the other way around. And Sean, can I, can I just step off for one second? Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry about that. So Ryan Bader fought Chet Congo to this no contest. And after the fight, Scott Coker was like, yeah, I don't know that Chet Congo gets another shot. I don't know that Chet Congo um, wants uh, or deserves another opportunity. Bader says that 
Congo took the easy way out. Now keep in mind, Congo's 44. This is this is his last run. If he loses, he's back to square one, but he didn't technically lose, even though he was well on his way. Now, this is nine straight fights that Congo has not lost. Bader technically has a defense of this <laughs> heavyweight title, and he is on a hot streak as well. So as we look at this, you've got Bader on, on the hottest streak of his career, even hotter than the one that he started. Chet Congo technically doesn't lose, even though he was about to. Joe, should they even run this back? Because Coker says no. No. No, I don't think they should. Thank you, by the way, guys. I've, I apologize for that <laughs> little emergency in the household. Uh, I won't say what it is, but that's fine. It's all uh -oh. taken care of. Uh, yeah. It's okay. I'm cutting away now. I'm sweating. Uh, <laughs> I, I, this whole Bader Congo thing. Um, he says that Congo took yeah. the easy way out by by taking the end of the fight. And what do you think? Well, uh, I think the most What's interesting the thing. To, yeah, the most interesting thing to come of this was Bader and Rampage fighting afterwards, and I don't have a <laughs> desire to see that fight again either. No. But Bellator will probably do it, but at least there was that angle. Yeesh. Yeah, I, I I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. Wrap, I've been still been trying to wrap my head around this for uh, a day or so. But I, I, I kind of agree with Bader, but I don't. Like an eye poke's an eye poke, and you know it's accidental and whatnot. But I don't know, man. It's, it's tough to say. You got to like Congo, man. You got a chance for a title here. You got to figure something out here. I know it sucks. I know it hurts, but. To, 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 these to, when these things happen to Bellator, I generally I genuinely feel bad. Yeah, right. And like it seems like it event, happens a lot. It feels like that, right? Yeah, it feels like that. So you just you feel bad. You feel bad, and it's just it is what it is. But you know, B Bader gets the the it's a no contest, right? But I don't think they're going to run it back. I really don't think they're going to run it back, and I don't think there's any desire to do so. I think there's some bad tastes. Uh, in a lot of people's mouths uh, regarding what happened with this main event. Uh, but, of course, the whole Bader and, and, and Rampage thing, um, I, you don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. But it's almost free, right? Like, it's, it's there's a potential there, right? And good on Rampage for, for being Rampage, right? You've got to do what you got to do. Uh, but I personally don't want to see that fight again, let's be yeah. honest. Junior Dos Santos versus Alexander Volkov headlines UFC Fight Night yeah. Moscow. Dig that fight. I like that fight, Joe. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly. It's it's a solid heavyweight fight. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll get your thoughts in a second, but I like Junior in this fight, man. I like Junior. I think Junior is just, he's on that little bit of a, a almost like a resurgence where he scared me, right? He's scaring me. Yeah. Unless you can, you can beat the timing on him when it comes to striking in that division, uh, I, I know you're probably going to laugh. Right, I know. I know you're probably thinking, "What am I nuts?" You know, I want to see Junior Dos Santos fight. Honestly, mm. Walt Harris. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind that. Or Curtis Blades. I would like to see him fight yeah. either one of those guys. Because Harris is like he said, no one can match my speed in this division. Let's and test that, it. Yeah, speed kills, dude. Speed kills. Let's see you against Junior. But Junior's book now, and then uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Guys, make sure you leave a thumbs up on this video. I can't tell you how much it helps us. Helps people find us. Uh, we also have Joe Rogan saying that he doesn't like the way that the UFC uh, ruins prospect. He says, quote, in boxing, managers dictate who the fighters fight and they do build their fighters up correctly. One of the things that bothers me about MMA uh, is I think there's some really good young fighters that get ruined. They get thrown to the wolves too quickly. They wind up getting their confidence shattered. They get knocked out when they shouldn't be. They're fighting the caliber of fighter they're not prepared for. There's always the argument for a guy like John Jones, but for every John Jones, there's a guy who's coming up that maybe could have been world champion but didn't get managed correctly. What do you think about this, Joe? Didn't get managed correctly. A is one option. B, the matchmaking is is the other option. Sometimes when you're with the UFC, you just basically you do what you're told, right? And, you're, and we were seeing that in these documents that are emerging from this lawsuit where yep. you've got like Joe Silva saying – if he doesn't agree to a new contract, I'll give him a tough opponent. Right? So it's the hammer. It's it's almost like the, the velvet hammer. Well, more than a velvet hammer, to be honest with you. It's like, it, it's not cool. It's it's This is the byproduct of the main number one organization in mixed martial arts. Uh, it's not a monopoly. Don't, 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 don't call it a monopoly. But they have a say. You want to fight here? This is who you're going to fight against. And I, I, 
not saying that Joel Silva, Sean Shelby, McMaynard, and, and anybody in the UFC has an agenda. Sure. But technically they do. It's their company. They're working for the UFC and they got to do what they got to do for their. They want to promote who they want to promote. Now, anybody other than Habib Nurmagomedov isn't somebody the UFC wants as a champion. Okay? That's not the guy you want as a champion. Because what the reason why he sells happens to be because he's such a nice guy. Uh, he, he, he's got a massive heart, does a lot of charity work. Look at the stuff he did in Africa. Uh, and has a massive following uh, from the Russian Dagestani slash Muslim world. Uh, Alexander Ovechkin, uh, half of the Russians that were playing for the Washington Capitals and across the NHL, love this guy. He's got a huge following. Therefore, you kind of let him do what he wants to do. But the UFC's preference is anyone that can move the needle. Conor McGregor moves the needle. As much as people are probably thinking he's a donkey right now, he moves the needle. <laughs> and, you know, Habib says, you know, forget about my last fight with that quote-unquote bullshit guy or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yikes. Yeah. Um, Conor sells fights. Yes, he does. And uh, Colby Covington. You know, it may, it may not translate, but he, he sells fights. He's a bit of a needle mover. Diaz doesn't follow anybody's rules, doesn't give a shit about anybody. He sells fights, right? So that's what you got to think about when you're a manager or a fighter. What can you do to sell fights other than what you're doing to perform inside the octagon, right? Because you're yeah, it's performance based. You got to win, but you got to win in spectacular fashion and have more that the UFC can say, hey, you know what? Let's let's build this guy here. So I understand what Joe Rogan's saying. There's been a bunch of fighters that could have been, should have been, would have been. I could name a whole whack that are Canadian. That could have been, should have been, would have been. But they just didn't follow the the recipe, the model that the UFC kind of likes, okay, uh, a.k.a. Rory McDonald. I mean, there's a bunch out there, uh, Canadian-wise, that I could say, you know what, if you'd have just did this, if you'd have just went on the Ultimate Fighter when you had the chance, or if you'd have said this or did that and blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, the little small things, little small things, like when you take a look at Sarah Morass's post-fight interview. Horrible. Mm -hmm. Horrendous. But no one is telling her that post-fight interview with Joe Rogan or John Anik or Daniel Cormier is money, is money to be made. You have to do more and be ready to answer questions and at the same time, rock the boat a little bit. Yeah. You don't do that. The UFC is like, oh, God, you got zero personality. And she's got a great personality. I've interviewed great her before. Great personality. And, yeah, we've sat Very down. Very funny. And, yeah, we sat down, me, Kevin Ioli, uh, Neil Davidson. We sat around at a round table. Uh, with her a while ago in Vegas, and she was absolutely hilarious. And I'm like, that's what you got to show people uh, on your social media uh, and in your post fight interviews, right? It's it's tough, but it's it's it, mm, it, it's it, it's difficult for the UFC to say, you know what? I'm going to promote these this person here, male or female. But at the same time, you wish they would be more fair because there's been fights that you and I have discussed. Like this is going to be ugly. This is not a good match sure. at all. Someone's going to get killed here, right? So. Well, there's some good matchups this Saturday, UFC Vancouver. The top part of this card is just real solid, Joe. Like, the prelims leave a lot to be desired. You got Austin Hubbard, minus 145, against Kyle Prepolek, a plus 125. Luis Smoka, a minus 220. Ryan McDonald, a plus 180. You have Chaz Skelly, a plus 120, against Jordan Griffin, a minus 140. You have Brad Katona looking to rebound. A minus 165 against Hunter Azur, a plus 145. Cole Smith, a plus 110. Miles Johns, a minus 130. Then you've got some uh, better names on the prelims. Augusto Sakai, a minus 115. Against Marcin Tibera, a minus 115. And then you also have Andrew Sanchez, a big plus 250 against Marvin Vittori, a minus 300. So the prelims, not great at all. Uh... A lot of pickums on this show. A lot of close lines on this show. Uh, Andrew Sanchez and Marvin Vittori stands out to me because yep. uh, that that's another uh, another situation where I think it's maybe uh, the the result is right and all that. But Andrew Sanchez isn't exactly a scrub or anything. He's looked uh, very good of late. I, I thought and uh, like the the fight against Barry Alt and the win against Marcus Perez. He really grinded those out. He's had a couple of really good runs. He looked good on the Ultimate Fighter, but he ran into Anthony Smith and Ryan Janes. Um, that's one that I would probably put five on because why not? Uh, that, other than that, there's not a lot of lines that are like wide out there that are catching my eyes, especially on this prelim show. Sakai and Tybura, 
minus 105 and minus 115, probably about right where it should be because it's hard to, to guess that one. Uh, what do you think of these prelim fights? Well, the Sakai Tabura fight, that's that's almost a pick em, right? Like, it's it's there, it's that close. Uh, and you're right, it could go either way. I think it's going to be actually a good fight. Uh, I just think it sucks that, you know, Marvin Vittori is a minus 300. I wish he was a plus 300. <laughs> put money on yeah. him, but he's a fantastic fighter. This is a guy that went the distance with the interim champ in Israel, uh, Adesanya. And, of course, Vittori's been, he was out for a while uh, with injury. So uh, everyone watching right now and, and probably listening later on, Vittori is a guy at middleweight that we should be paying attention to. Forget the stupid Italian bias that I may have. Yes, I know he's Italian. I'm just saying he's a fantastic fighter. I think he's got skills, uh, and I do think he's underappreciated. Uh, I do think he's going to surprise a lot of people. Um, the Smolka Ryan McDonald fight at plus 180. Ryan McDonald, I think he got five on that one. Yeah, if I got it, because usually I take three no matter what, or at least three for the weekend. I like to do three in case somebody wants to do some wild ass parlay or something and then blame me for it afterwards. But um, yeah, that would be a close one too because Luis Smoka has had some consistency issues in the past. But then I look at this main card, Joe, and it's a good main card. Like as far as what I think quality fights could be or relevant fights, Jim Crute, a minus 115, Misha Serkinov, a minus 105. This is a real good fight in the light heavyweight division. Jim Crute is a guy that I look to really step up in this division and do good things. And I think that uh, Serkinov is the right kind of opponent for him because, it, hey, worst case scenario, Jim Crute doesn't win this. He's not undefeated anymore. And Misha Serkinov, a guy who the UFC re-signed and has skidded big time, lost three of four, uh, gets back on track. But Jim Crute, I have winning this one. He's looked really good since uh, that Dana White Contender Series win. He was a guy who wasn't really finishing his fights as he got into the UFC uh, and then has stepped in and just beaten everybody. Uh, Paul Craig, Sam Alvey, Chris Bertier. Uh, the Alvey win, finishing Alvey in two under two, three minutes, that one stood out to me. I got him winning this fight. How do you see it going? Uh, the Alvey, wasn't the Alvey one where Sam took that on short notice? Yeah, but, I mean, Sam Alvey. It's Alvey's. still a fantastic, yeah, yeah. yeah Sam so, Alvey, yeah. Um, yeah, J Jim he, Cruz, He's no as joke. ready to fight on short notice as he is on three months' notice. <laughs> That's true. Very true. Uh, you know, Jimmy's undefeated. Um, I mean, you tell me, is Misha not on thin ice? He's got to be. He's got to be. Three or four? Point. Losing three or four? Got to be. Yeah, and then you lose this, it's four or five. Yeah. So me, the, the pressure is on Misha Sirkunov to win this fight, and it's also in Canada. Yeah. Right? Him being from the Toronto region. A lot of pressure on Misha. Uh, and maybe he takes that pressure and turns it into something, you know, hones it in and turns it into a fantastic performance. Uh, but then it, we're going to, you and I will label him, uh, you know, the Uriah Hall at 205. We just don't know what to expect. The Michael Johnson. We don't know what's going to happen with this guy fight to fight. So I, I'm kind of leaning towards Jimmy Crute in this fight. Uh, but if Misha pulls it off, you know, I, w I wish he would, to be honest with you, yeah. being a Canadian um, and a guy that I know. But it's tough, man. It's tough to say uh, which – I don't know what's going he on with Misha. beat my coach to get into the UFC, so I don't know, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, funny you mentioned Uriah Hall. He's a plus 180 against uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. shoe face. At plus 180, I got to take – I got to put five on Uriah Hall just because of the unpredictability of it. He's won two of his last three, but has had trouble getting in the cage. First fight this year. Shoeface lost a few months ago against Ian Heinish. I didn't think that would happen. I thought that he would mop the floor with uh, Ian Heinish. I don't expect anybody to mop the floor with Uriah Hall. Uh, I do expect some people to beat him. I expect him to lose to some people. But also, I expect situations like the Gegard Musashi fight to happen. And as we have seen, when Uriah Hall pulls the trigger, he almost always wins, Joe. Almost mm. always, when he mm. pulls the trigger. It's just mm. a matter of getting that to happen. I mean, look at look at his wins. How many wins does he have in the UFC via decision, Joe? I'm going to go with what is zero five, for 500, Alex. One. 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 Tiago Santos. One. Tiago Santos. Otherwise, he finishes people. Sometimes, I mean, here's the thing. Sometimes when he pulls the trigger, he doesn't win. But when he doesn't pull the trigger, he never wins. Uh, then you have Shoeface, who 
he'll drag you down, he'll he'll put it in the hooks, and he'll he'll choke you. That's you have to watch the rear naked choke for him. That's his go-to, that's his bread and butter, and he is exceptional at it. I'm not confident that Uriah Hall can get out of it if he's if he's got the hooks in on the back. So I, I'm probably going shoe face here. But at that line and with the other uh, betting lines on this card, I got to put five on Uriah Hall just in case. <laughs> I like the just in case bets. Those are always my favorite. Uh, I, I think shoe face does emerge victorious. At, 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 you know, who's the better wrestler here? Uriah Hall uh, or, or Antonio Carlos Jr. Yeah. Or who's the better takedown artist? Right? Who's got better takedown defense? So as long as Carlos can or, or shoe face can avoid getting tagged by the monster that is Uriah Hall, and this fight goes to the ground, I'm not saying you get your stopwatch out and, and just click and see how, many, how long it takes for him to submit Uriah Hall, but there's a huge advantage, in my opinion, uh, with Shoeface on the ground versus Uriah Hall. Uh, and Uriah Hall, if you compare Uriah Hall's stand-up versus Shoefaces and Shoefaces' ground game versus Uriah Hall's, I think the big discrepancy uh, and, and the favor goes into to Shoefaces' corner. I think he gets the fight down on the ground. I think he emerges victorious. But like you said, you got to put five on Uriah Hall because just in case he lands something absolutely insane that'll send that arena into absolute uh, you know, pandemonium. So you just never know. But I'm, I'm leaning towards shoe facing this fight. Talk about a blast from the past. Todd Duffy, a plus 100 against Jeff Hughes, a minus 120. There are a lot of you watching this who have no clue who Todd Duffy is. That's because he hasn't fought since 2015. Um, he has taken just years of absence, multiple, three times due to injury, due to tragedy, all kinds of stuff. Ten years ago, Joe, after he beat Tim Haig in seven seconds, he was a 23-year-old prospect that everybody was looking at like, whoa, is he going to be the next big thing? And he wasn't. He had that fight against Mike Rousseau that was just unbelievable that Rousseau came back and beat him. And um, Alistair over him mopped the floor with him on New Year's Eve. And then he disappeared. He disappeared for a year and a half. He started to fight in uh, in Super Fight League. And it's like, okay, well, he's back in the UFC. He fought Phil DeFreeze. He dominated and won that fight. And that was a good win back then, too. Then he didn't fight for two more years. He beat Anthony Hamilton, did it impressively, looked like he was back on track, and then he fought once in 2015 and got his ass whipped by Frank Mir. We have not seen him since. They tried to book him in 2017. Duffy had to withdraw. 33 is still young at heavyweight, but the sad reality is a decade has been wasted of this guy's career. Just flushed down the tube. And, and he couldn't help it. it. It's not his fault. It's physical stuff. It's it's a lot of health-related stuff. And he's facing a guy that wants to get his first UFC win. We don't see a lot of situations like Todd Duffy in MMA or the UFC, Joe. He would be fantastic, quote-unquote, new blood uh, to this division if he can just start reeling off is, some fights here. that nuts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, fun fact about that Mike Russell fight uh, at UFC 114 uh, we interviewed uh, Todd Duffy that day, not that day, that week leading up to the event. And when I when I was connected with him, and we were just shooting the breeze, saying, "Listen, we want to do this and get this." And do you think you have time for a, for a cr quick interview? He's like, "Look, I'm just going with my girlfriend right now uh, to grab a bite to eat." Reaches into his pocket, gives me his hotel room key. Oh, he wow. goes, "Go there, set it up. We'll see you there in, in an hour." Walked into his room. <laughs> we just set up everything. Did a fantastic interview. Uh, we were looking forward to his fight, and then he gets KO'd in the third round. We I mean, were not expecting that at all. Not to be morbid or anything, but we're talking about him being new blood, and the, his breakout win was against a guy who died two years ago. Yeah, yeah. The, and and that's and that win was a decade ago, and upon his return, there's been nothing that has indicated that he's not capable of that. But I feel like he has to win. He'll get another fight no matter what if he wants one. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could take another three years off and get another fight, I think. But <laughs> Yeah, and listen, it, it, overall he's a great guy, but it's just been a rough go for him in his mixed martial arts career. Hopefully he's been making some money somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things where he wins and it could start – 
well, any one of heavyweight really, but I I think he's marketable. Look at him. I think he's he a is. marketable guy, right? Uh, and I think he could do great in this division. The problem is his age is not on his side, but it's the heavyweight division. And if you can get that footwork on point and launch those strikes, you could cause a lot of damage at, 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 at you know above 205 pounds. Yeah, and quite honestly, I don't know what the guy looks like these days. He, Good point. He could look like Mark Hunt for all I know. Well, for all we know, that these a lot of these fights were pre-USADA. Not yeah. accusing him of anything, I'm just saying. Nikita Krylov, a minus 120 against Glover Teixeira, a plus 100. I am putting five on it. <laughs> Not only that, uh, I will put five. I will, I will go as far as to put five on Teixeira, a plus 150 inside the distance. There is no prop listed for submission. If you find one, I am putting five on Glover Teixeira via submission. Um, I... Okay, Nikita Krylov has shown glimpses of brilliance and glimpses of ignorance. <laughs> I, the guy can be a wrecking ball. I don't know how he beats Glover Teixeira, even with Glover being 40 next month. Because here's the thing. I don't think Nikita is better than Ian Kutalaba. I really don't. And I mean, maybe I'm being too harsh on Nikita Krylov, but... Joe, I just I see so many things in this guy's game, and I'm like, how does he keep racking up wins? It doesn't make sense to me. But somehow he does, and somehow I come on this podcast just like after the Ed Herman fight, and uh, just like uh, after when he was beating people up in Fight Nights Global, and just like after the OSP fight, and I'm like, well, okay. But then there are times like Jan Blahovich and Misha Serkinov where I'm like, see, I told you. And it wasn't hard for these guys. What do you think about this one? First things first, there's no lock that Glover Teixeira is going to win this co-main event. Okay? There, there's, there's, there's no lock. He's going to win this fight and come help you build a deck again. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, uh, listen, I, the reason why I say that is because, you know, not more than a week or two ago, we saw what happened uh, in the UFC's uh, women's strawweight division. Right? Yeah. Uh, anything can happen in MMA. You, you, if you're asking me uh, on the streets of, you know, mean streets of Stouffville, Ontario, make a pick, Glover Teixeira, Nikita Krylov, you're damn right I'm going with Glover Teixeira, not because I think the guy's an absolute awesome dude. I just look at this on paper and think to myself, Teixeira's going to knock this guy's brains out, yeah. uh, and if he doesn't, he'll tap him out, right? And I don't care if, if Glover Teixeira is 75 years old, right? He, he's just got old man strength, old man power. Uh, the heart of a lion just won't go away. And, and Krylov is another guy that to us is unpredictable. We don't know who's going to show. You see so many holes in his game. Uh, you know, the, the, the Sean Ross Sapp book of holes and games, and it's, <laughs> it's there, right? And I, Krylov can surprise us both. Let's let's not kid ourselves. But on this fight here, paper versus paper, I got Glover to share all day, every day. Yeah, I do too. Tell you one a lot tougher to pick. Justin Gaethje, a minus 190. Donald Cerrone a plus one sixty five. This rounds out my I got five on it. Donald Cerrone plus one sixty five. Glover Teixeira plus one hundred. Uh, probably, probably Uriah Hall plus one eighty. Not not wide gaps by any stretch, but you also have a couple of decent, uh, more valuable ones in Andrew Sanchez and Ryan McDonald. But man, Donald Cerrone, I'm surprised that the the that it's not a little bit closer. Like maybe a plus one ten, a plus one hundred. Donald Cerrone is an exceptionally well-rounded fighter. Uh, Justin Gaethje subscribes a, a bit to the old Chuck Liddell school of MMA where he's got really good wrestling, but he'd rather stand up and punch you in the face. And he's got that low calf kick yep. that can change your life. It can completely change everything, Joe. Gaethje, after losing two in a row, has stepped up and beat James Vick and Edson Barboza back-to-back. -back. And Donald Cerrone looked like he was done at the elite levels. Looked like it after Darren Teal. Looked like it after Leon Edwards. He came back. He beat Mike Perry, Alex Hernandez, Ally Quinta, all great names. Uh, the Tony Ferguson fight, I would have loved to have seen that happen again. It didn't. This is a pretty good consolation, though. What, what? How do you think this one's going? I think it's too early for Donald Cerrone to be fighting again. Yeah. That's always been Fair. his... When he loses fights, generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, it's it's because he's taken fights too quickly. 
Uh, I'll never forget when Greg Jackson told me a long time ago that run that he had at one point. Uh, it was like insane. It was to the point. I'm trying to go back and look at when it was. I think it was uh, WC51, Jamie Varner, then Chris Vardesky, then Paul Kelly, then Wagner Rocha, then Charles Oliveira, then Dennis Seaver. Uh, and he was just fighting like fight, 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 fight. And then he ran into Nate Diaz. Yeah. And Nate Diaz pushes the pace. Uh, and then, you know, he got back on track, took out Jeremy Stevens, Milman Gallard, uh, and did take some time off, but then ran into Anthony Pettis, took a body kick, and that'll shut anybody down. But it got to the point where if Donald doesn't fight as consistently as he wants, he does better. He's coming off a TKO stoppage uh, versus Tony Ferguson. And he we thought his two- orbital was yeah. broken. Yeah. All right? Yeah, exactly. So I, I, that was in June. You know, I know it's September right now. But it's a quick turnaround, in my opinion, for a fighter. I know Don Cerrone's special uh, and stuff like that. But uh, you take a look, and, and you know, Justin Gaethje's coming off a murder of Edson Barbosa, yeah. right? Like that was a first round, two and a half minute drubbing in March. He's had time to recover from that. His body's electrical system has been able to shut down, relax, uh, and get some training in there. Okay, uh, I'm going with Justin Gaethje in this fight. As much as I hate it, well, I like both guys. Don't get me wrong. I, th- I but, think it's a safe bet. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. Yeah, so I, really I don't know do. about putting five on Cerrone. I get what you're saying, but I'm staying away of putting, not putting five on Donald. I'd rather be wrong than right, to be honest with you. Well, guys, I will give you a bit of a post show on Saturday. We'll talk about these fights again next Tuesday. Make sure you guys leave a thumbs up. Subscribe to our MMA and Boxing channel, youtube.com slash Fightful MMA Boxing. Leave that thumbs up. Joe, what do you got going on this week? Same old sale. You going to give us your five? You all got, I got fives on it? I did. Oh, you did? Sorry, yeah. my bad. I'll just throw out that. Okay. Yeah. Well, same old, same old for me, man. Same old, same old. The work, 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 soccer, soccer, soccer. It's coming. We're winding down uh, our uh, summer season. Going to do our tryouts and get ready for our nice. inverse. But work, work, work. Boys lost their first game of the year on uh, Friday. It was, eh, wasn't their fault. You know, I got some parents. Uh, call me an asshole. You can call me a jerk. You can call <laughs> me whatever you want. But there's some players that are getting cut because of their parents. They're going to be replaced if wow. you can't cut. You can't commit to a high-level program and not want to come out because it's raining against one of the best teams out there. You don't belong on my team. So, yeah. Dang. Well, you guys can tune in to Fightful.com. we got lots of shows for you. Until next time, guys, follow Joe at Joe A. Ferraro. Follow me at Sean Rossaff. Follow us at Fightful and Fightful MMA. We're out.